September the 11th, 2001 was a tragic day in the United States. I remember it very, very vividly. We were at our offices in Montgomery, Alabama. We hardly ever, in fact, uh, never turned the television on. I can probably count on, on one hand the times that the television has been on, watching television during our office hours. But that day, we thought it so important we needed to turn it on. And the picture we saw took us by surprise, needless to say. The Twin Towers going up in smoke, the terrorists had hijacked those planes and flown two of them into the Twin Towers there in New York and another one into the Pentagon. Tragedy had stricken the United States of America. But in all of the tragedy and all of the turmoil, there was one single name that was searched for more than any other name on any web search, Google, Yahoo, all of those web search engines. And it wasn't a name that, that you would expect. It wasn't Osama bin Laden. It wasn't the name of a terrorist group. The name was Nostradamus. You see, people claimed that Nostradamus had predicted that this was going to happen to the United States of America. Millions and millions and millions of people searched the name Nostradamus to see if that claim was true. Supposedly, there was a famous quatrain. That's what Nostradamus was famous for. Four lines of cryptic poetry that supposedly told about eagles flying into towers and those towers being in a land of the West and that being the prediction of what had occurred on September the 11th. When all the smoke had cleared and the research was done, Nostradamus hadn't predicted a thing. He certainly hadn't predicted the fall of the Twin Towers and he hadn't predicted any type of terrorist activity. But what that did help us to understand is that everybody in the world knows that the ability to accurately predict the future is something superhuman. It's something that a mere human cannot do. And if there is a human out there that can do it, then that human is so special, deserves so much attention, that he, well, would be speaking from God. You see, it has been recognized for centuries that if there ever was a person or a book that could accurately predict the future and never be wrong and look hundreds of years into the future and describe minute details about what was happening or what would happen, then that writing or that person would be speaking from God. Predictive prophecy. The ability to tell the future. If the Bible contains the ability to tell the future, if the Bible accurately predicts what happens in the future in minute detail and is never wrong, that ability would be superhuman, would be above human ability. It would be something that would prove the divine inspiration of the Bible. Does the Bible accurately predict the future? Let's look at several Bible verses that give us some criteria by which we could judge predictive prophecy. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 18, looking in verse 21 and following, read with me, Deuteronomy 18, 21. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that's the thing which the Lord has not spoken. <laughs> that's pretty simple, isn't it? If someone claims to be predicting the future and they say, God told me X or God told me Y. And if X or Y does not come true, that person's not speaking from God. It's very easy to understand. The year 2000 saw many people claiming divine revelation, saying that the end of the world was going to come in the year 2000. Why 2K? People stocked up on all kinds of, of goods and supplies because there was supposed to be a huge crash worldwide of all computers and things were supposed to go crazy. 2000. That didn't happen. What's that tell us about the people who supposedly gave us divine revelation that it would? 
it tells us they didn't have divine revelation. That's easy to understand. What else does this tell us about divine revelation? It tells us that if the Bible ever makes a prediction that doesn't come to pass, then the Bible's not God's Word. Let me ask you a question. How many times would the Bible have to misstep? Would the Bible have to get a prediction wrong in order for it not to be God's Word? You know, could the Bible be right 50% of the time and, and it still be God's Word? 60% of the time? 70% of the time? What about 90% of the time? Only 10% of it isn't accurate. Would that make the Bible God's Word divinely inspired? No. Moses says that if there's a person or a book that claims to be speaking for God and says something's going to happen in the future and it doesn't happen, guess what? That person's not speaking for God. Now, Jeremiah tells us something different. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 28, verse 9, explains this to us. He says, As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. That's pretty easy to understand. Moses says, if a prophet says something, it doesn't come to pass, that prophet's not from God. Jeremiah says, if a prophet says something and it does come to pass, that person is from God. So there's your criteria. If the Bible says something that's going to happen in the future, and it does come to pass every time that the Bible says, then the Bible is from God. God used a similar criteria when He was speaking to the idol worshipers. In fact, it was as if He was speaking to the idols themselves. In Isaiah 41, He says this, verses 22 and 23. Let them, talking about the idols... Bring forth and show us what will happen, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. He says, look, there's an easy way for us to know if Baal, this idol, is really a god. Just tell us something that's going to happen in the future. If you tell us something that's going to happen in the future, and it comes to pass, we'll know you're a god. It's a simple test. God didn't throw this out just for the idols. In fact, God wanted you to understand that you can apply this same test to the Bible to see if it passes the test. Does the Bible contain predictive prophecy? I want you to understand that there is so much predictive prophecy in the Bible, it would take literally hours and hours and days to go over all of the predictive prophecy in the Bible. People have written entire books filled with hundreds and hundreds of pages on the prophetic messages in the Bible. We don't have that kind of time in this session. I am going to provide for you three solid examples of predictive prophecy in the Bible. If you want more, they are out there. But these three, I think, are a very good sampling of what the Bible can and has done in the past as it relates to predicting the future. In Ezekiel chapter 26, you're going to read about the fall of Tyre. Tyre was a city that you might be familiar with. Maybe you'll recall that when David was king and his son Solomon, they had dealings with Hiram, the king of Tyre. Tyre is located on the northwest of Jerusalem, right on the Mediterranean Sea, to the northwest of Jerusalem, about a hundred miles or so. It just so happens that it's in the perfect place for worldwide commerce. In about 1200 BC, Tyre started to rise to prominence. In fact, it became so wealthy that it was world-renowned for its wealth, for its huge walls, for its ability to withstand attacks. But in all of its trading, in all of its glory, in all of the money that was pouring into Tyre, Tyre started developing an attitude, an attitude of superiority, an attitude of sinfulness, an attitude of haughty arrogance. In fact, the Bible explains that when the children of Israel had been defeated, Tyre, in essence, would kick the children of Israel while they were down. Tyre was well known for its slave trade, and we have historical evidence that the Tyrians most likely sold the Israelites and captives from Israel into slavery. You see, as Tyre began to rise to prominence, Tyre became evil and wicked. 
In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 16 through 18, Ezekiel says, By the abundance of your trading, talking about Tyre, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of splendor. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. In Ezekiel chapter 26, Ezekiel explained what was going to happen to Tyre. Now, he made this prophecy in about 592 B.C. And in 592 B.C., Ezekiel said that King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was going to come up and surround the city of Tyre. Ezekiel also explained that Nebuchadnezzar would build a siege mound against the city, that many nations would come up against Tyre, that the city would be flattened like the top of a rock, and the stones and the timber and the soil would be laid in the sea. And it would be a place for the spreading of nets. Well, the historical record verifies for us that King Nebuchadnezzar in 586 did come up against the city of Tyre. That was a few years after the prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar came up, destroyed the villages around the city of Tyre, and built a siege mound around the city. And that siege lasted for 13 years until about 573 B.C. And in 573 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar finally breached the city, finally was successful at getting into the walls of the city. But when he did, he found something very interesting. You see, the city of Tyre had a very convenient location. Right there on the Mediterranean Sea, about three-quarters of a mile out, they had an island city. And during that 13-year siege, they had been removing all of their goods and equipment and food, anything that they would need to the island city, so that when Nebuchadnezzar came in 13 years after the siege, he came into an empty city, and all the Tyrians had moved to the island city about three-fourths of a mile out in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, Ezekiel knew that this took place. In fact, the Bible explains in Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 18... Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyre. Every head was made bald, every shoulder rubbed raw, yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre for the labor which they expended on it. You see, if the prophecy were to stop there, we would think, well, maybe there's not enough time between when Ezekiel made the prophecy to when the prophecy actually came true. Maybe uh, we don't have a, a long enough span of time. Because, you know, Ezekiel made the prophecy in about 592 B.C. Uh, he then knew of Nebuchadnezzar getting into the city and not gathering any wages from Tyre. But there are several things about the prophecy that in 573 B.C. hadn't come true yet. Remember that Ezekiel said that the city would be scraped clean like a rock, said that the soil, the timber, the rocks would be thrown into the sea. Why would this have been surprising when Ezekiel made that prophecy? You don't just throw good building material into the sea. You don't just waste good rocks and good lumber and good soil. Uh, lots of times when a group of people would attack another nation and they would destroy a city, if they didn't burn the city, many times they would just reuse the rocks. And if they did burn the city, they could still reuse the stones and the rocks many times. And they would use those materials to rebuild a city. Or sometimes they would even move those materials and use them to build another city. It was unprecedented in the annals of history for a city to be scraped clean like a rock, for all of the soil and the timber and the stones to be thrown into the sea, what in the world would cause something like that to happen? In 592 and 573, nobody knew. But then a man came on the scene in 333-332 B.C. Alexander the Great. Maybe you'll recognize his name. The son of Philip of Macedon, the man who around the age of 30, it is said, bowed his head and wept because there was no more world to conquer. The man who stretched across the then known world and basically defeated every enemy in his path. 
You see, he sent a message to Tyre in 333 B.C. And he said, I want to come and offer a sacrifice in the temple of Heracles. The Tyrians, confident that Alexander the Great would not be able to get into their city, denied him and said, no, you can't offer a sacrifice in the temple of Heracles. We will not let you in. So Alexander the Great decided that he was going to go into the city of Tyre and he besieged that city for approximately seven months. Now the Tyrians, understanding their history in that seven-month siege, did exactly what they did during the siege of Nebuchadnezzar. They all moved out to the Ivan city. Seven months later, Alexander the Great breaches the walls of the mainland city and realizes that his victory is hollow and empty. There are no inhabitants. All of the goods and all of the supplies and everything is gone. Well, of course, Alexander the Great wasn't a world conqueror for nothing. He doesn't just say, well, boys, looks like we're licked this time. I guess we'll have to come back later. No, he decided that he was going to get out to that island city. And so he decided he would scrape the entire mainland city of Tyre clean like a rock. And he would dump all of the soil and all of the lumber and all of the rocks as much as they needed into the Mediterranean Sea and build a huge land bridge. And that's exactly what he did. He dumped the entire city, almost, of mainland city of Tyre into the Mediterranean Sea and built a land causeway by which he then marched out to the island city of Tyre and destroyed it. Now how in the world would Ezekiel have known 250 years before that all of the timber and soil and stones were going to be cast into the sea. That was an unprecedented statement in that time. Well, many people have tried to redate Ezekiel. They have tried to say, well, maybe he made these statements after 330 B.C., but they cannot successfully do that, and the date stands at 592 B.C. Well, others have said, well, yes, but this prophecy doesn't really work because uh, Tyre's still there. A man by the name of Pharaoh Till wrote this statement in Prophecies, Imaginary and Unfulfilled, an article that he had. He says, in fact, Tyre still exists today, as anyone able to read a map can verify. This obvious failure of a highly touted Old Testament prophet is just one more nail in the coffin of the Bible inerrancy doctrine. He says, look guys, if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, go back and look at the prophecy against Tyre. See what it said was going to happen to Tyre and then go pick up a map. When you do, you're going to see a city named Tyre right on that map. This shows that the Bible's not the inspired word of God. Well, does that show that the Bible's not the inspired word of God? Is it true that Tyre has been rebuilt? The uh, prophecy there in Ezekiel 26 said that the city would never be rebuilt. Is it true that modern day Tyre is a rebuilding of the Tyre that was in the Bible? Uh, let's see if that's the case. In 1170 AD, a man by the name of Benjamin of Tudela, a Jew who had been traveling around the world keeping a diary, wrote this about Tyre. He said, A man can ascend the walls of new Tyre and see ancient Tyre, which the sea has now covered. And should one care to go forth by boat, one can see the castles, marketplaces, streets, and palaces in the bed of the sea. In Ezekiel 26 verse 19, Ezekiel said, For thus says the Lord God, when I make you a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring the deep upon you and great waters cover you. What did Ezekiel say was going to happen to the city of Tyre? Great waters were going to cover it in 1170. What did Benjamin of Tudela say had happened? He said you could go out there and see the city of Tyre, what was left of it, buried by the sea. Uh, let me give you another statement from a book called The History of Tyre, a man by the name of Jacob Kotzenstein. In his book about Tyre, he says this, Later, this town was dismantled by Alexander the Great in his famous siege of Tyre and disappeared totally 
with the change of the coastline brought about by the dike and the alluvian deposits that changed Tyre into a peninsula. He said, oh yeah, we used to have a mainland city of Tyre. It used to be there. But it's not there anymore. In fact, nobody knows exactly where it ever was now because it has totally disappeared because the entire coastline has changed because of that causeway that Alexander built in 333 B.C. Now let's address Mr. Till. Can you slap the name Tyre on any city that you want to? Could I decide right now that I wanted to go and plop a city down in the middle of Tennessee and name it Tyre? Certainly I could. Would that be rebuilding the ancient city of Tyre that Ezekiel prophesied would never be rebuilt? No. Just because you've got a city near where you think the old mainland city of Tyre was and it's named Tyre doesn't mean you've rebuilt the city. In fact, we've got evidence to show that the city was totally covered by water and that it has completely disappeared from all modern knowledge knowing the exact location of the mainland city of Tyre. Was this prophecy fulfilled? Absolutely, positively. Was it fulfilled in minute detail, in unprecedented action by Alexander the Great when he dumped all of the stuff into the Mediterranean Sea? You know it was. This is an example of excellent predictive prophecy of which the Bible is filled. Uh, let's look at another example. The fall of Babylon. Babylon was a city that had a history. A storied history, a majestic history. In fact, they say that the walls of ancient Babylon were some 300 feet high. If you can get that in your mind, that's a 10-story building. And they say that the walls of Babylon were 75 feet thick. You could drive three chariots shoulder to shoulder on top of the walls of the city of Babylon. The city was impregnable by anybody's standards. In fact, the Euphrates River ran under the city. But it didn't just run under the city. It ran around the city. The Babylonians had so devised, it ran under the city of Babylon, and they had so devised the city that the Euphrates River created a moat that in places was 260 feet wide. If you were to say, what city is there that doesn't look like it could possibly in any shape, form, or fashion be defeated militarily, guess what city that would have been? Babylon. It was so large that you could fit 20 years worth of supplies in it just in case somebody wanted to put you under siege if you lived in Babylon. But Babylon's history with Israel caused Babylon to, to come into some serious trouble. You see, the ten tribes of Israel that had broken away with Jeroboam, in about 720 B.C., the Assyrians had come in and captured them and carried them away. But the lower two tribes of Israel, Judah and Benjamin, they had remained faithful for a little while longer until about 605 B.C. or so when the Babylonians came in and took away, deported the people that lived there in Judah. Because of this deportation, the Babylonians were being used by God to teach the children of Israel some lessons, but the Babylonians weren't faithful. They weren't doing right. And they had adopted an attitude of, there again, superiority and arrogance. Read Jeremiah 50 verses 17 and 18 with me. The Bible says, Israel is like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria devoured him. Now at last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon has broken his bones. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. You see, Babylon had taken Judah and when they had done that, they had done horrible things to many of the people in Judah and they had become arrogant. Read with me their attitude that we see in Isaiah 47, verses 7 through 8. Babylon, being personified, is saying this. Babylon herself says, I shall be a lady forever. 
I am and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Babylon saying, you can't defeat me. I am and there's no one else. I will not be a widow. I will not know the loss of children. I am impregnable. I am undefeatable. I am it. And there's nothing else besides me. Well, if you've read your Bible very much at all, you understand when a person adopts that kind of attitude, the Lord quickly steps in and helps them to realize that God is it. And humans are not. And God does what He wants. And that's exactly what He did. In fact, that's exactly what He predicted He was going to do several years before it ever happened. Jeremiah, making the prediction in 605 B.C., said that the city would be taken by the king of the Medes. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 50, 38, that a drought would be upon her waters. Jeremiah also said that God would dry up her sea in Jeremiah 51, 36. And Jeremiah said her guardians would be drunken and sleep a perpetual sleep. What happened to Babylon? The secular historical records tell us exactly what happened to Babylon. In about 539 B.C., Babylon had finished her course. Babylon, it was time to see that Babylon was to be defeated. In 539 B.C., the king of the Medes came against the city. And the king of the Medes, exactly as Jeremiah had predicted, realized that the city could not be taken militarily. Realized that there was no amount of force, no possible way that the walls could be broken down, no possible way that a battering ram could be brought against any one of the major gates of the city. Realized that something was going to have to be done other than a straightforward attack. As he watched the river Euphrates pouring under the Babylonian city, city of Babylon. He came up with an idea. He diverted the Euphrates River into a lake basin that was to the west of the city, and it was a huge lake basin. And he stationed soldiers at the entrance where the river went under the city of Babylon. At his command, when the river Euphrates was diverted, he had his soldiers dress up as revelers, as drunken partiers. When the Euphrates was diverted, he sent his Medes and Persians into the city of Babylon. The Babylonians weren't even protecting the entrance. They were all involved in a drunken festival and didn't even know that they had been attacked until it was absolutely positively too late. They had, as Jeremiah predicted, been involved in a drunken slumber and slept a perpetual sleep after the king of the Medes had dried up the rivers of Babylon. Several other predictions about the destruction of Babylon and how it would be a place of devastation and a land of wilderness where animals would walk and trod and where people would no longer live. Several of the other of those that are found in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51 came true exactly as Jeremiah had predicted hundreds of years after Jeremiah predicted them. The fall of Babylon, another excellent example of predictive prophecy. There's one more line of predictive prophecy that I think is of utmost importance for us to understand. Messianic prophecy. What is messianic prophecy? Messianic prophecy is the idea that the Bible contains things about the coming Messiah that would foretell who was the Messiah. We've got an entire lesson on this in a previous Pillars of Faith seminar that deals with Jesus Christ. An entire lesson titled uh, Messianic Prophecy. Here I just want to touch on it because it's so important as it relates to predictive prophecy in the Bible. You see there are over 300 different prophecies 
about the Messiah that are in the Old Testament. The interesting thing about those 300 prophecies, in about 265, a man in Alexandria decided he wanted a Greek copy of the Old Testament. And so he had several people translate the Greek copy of the Old Testament, and that is called the Septuagint. Some people call it the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek copy of the Old Testament that was produced in about 265 B.C. Uh, what's that mean? Well, here's what that means. That means that every single one of the Messianic prophecies we know for a fact was nailed down 265 years before Jesus ever stepped foot on the earth. Now, we have good dating methods that show they were all prior to that, but if there's someone who is absolutely positively skeptical and will accept none of those rational good evidences, he can't get around the 265, 250 date that we have the Greek copy of the Old Testament Scriptures. What do we find in the Old Testament Scriptures as they relate to the Messiah? Well, it just so happens that we find the birthplace of the Messiah. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2 we are told that the Messiah is going to come out of Bethlehem Ephrathah. Not only is the Messiah going to come out of Bethlehem but Bethlehem Ephrathah. Lower Bethlehem, southern Bethlehem. Just so happens that there were two Bethlehems, just like there are several Nashvilles. You know it'd be one thing to say uh, that someone is going to be born in Nashville. It'd be another thing to say someone's going to be born in Nashville, Tennessee because there just happened to be several Nashvilles. If someone were trying to concoct his life to mimic or to fit the messianic prophecies, what would it be impossible for a person to do? It'd be impossible for a person to uh, concoct where he would be born, wouldn't it? Uh, how in the world would somebody mastermind a way to be born somewhere. You just couldn't do that. What about other messianic prophecies that explain to us how the Messiah is going to be buried? Isaiah 53 saying that the Messiah, his death was going to be made with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because there was no guile found in him. Watch what the messianic prophecy is doing for you. What could a person not control where he is born? What else could a person not control or it would be very hard to control? Where he is buried. Now, he could leave some pretty uh, detailed instructions as to where he wanted to be buried. But if it just so happened that you underwent a trial and that trial you were found to be a, a criminal, now, even more than a criminal according to the courts and they sentenced you to death and you hung on a cross. What couldn't you control? You couldn't control where they were going to bury you. But in Isaiah 53 it says he made, they made his grave with the wicked. What's that mean? Just so happened Jesus was crucified between two thieves. But with the rich at his death, what's, what's that mean? Joseph of Arimathea came and took the body and placed it in a tomb fit for a rich man, even carved out by a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, predicting how the Messiah would be buried, where he would be born, how he would be buried, how much he would be betrayed for. The Bible tells us in the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 13, that the Messiah was going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. When we read in the New Testament... Four different accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The skeptic has tried to say, well, these are contradictory accounts. They're not, but when the skeptic says that, guess what he does? Recognizes that they are independent accounts. What do the gospel accounts show us? That Jesus was betrayed by Judas. How much did Judas receive for his betrayal? Thirty pieces of silver. Not only that, the book of Zechariah explains to us that that money would be used to buy the potter's field, which is exactly what happened to the 30 pieces of silver that Judas returned. But they thought, oh, this is blood money and we can't put it back into the temple treasury, so we have to do something with it. So we use it to buy the potter's field, exact, field exactly as Zechariah had predicted. Also, Isaiah 53, predicting the conduct of the Messiah, that he would be led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened 
not his mouth. Other messianic prophecies telling us that the Messiah would be preceded by a messenger, and that messenger, of course, being John the baptizer, said that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey exactly as Jesus did. With one of Jesus' last breaths on the cross, he screamed, he cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which the Bible tells us is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which just so happens to be a verbatim quote from Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. And when you turn to Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, and start reading the psalm, you realize that it is a predictive messianic prophecy in which it states that the clothes of the Messiah would be cast lots for. The soldiers at the foot of the cross of Christ were casting lots for his clothes. And Jesus, with one of his last breaths before his death, was beckoning all those who were watching to turn their minds back to Psalm 22 and realize that this had been predicted for a thousand years. Does the Bible contain accurate, predictive prophecy? Absolutely. A resounding yes. What does that mean to us? Jeremiah nailed it when he said in Jeremiah 28 verse 9, When the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. What is the Bible known as? The book that the Lord has truly inspired.